This event is co-sponsored by the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies and Duke University Middle East Studies Center. It's also part of the UPEP Environmental Institution Seminar Series organized by Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, University Program in Environmental Policy, Nicholas School of the Environment, and Sanford School of Public Policy. I wanna thank all of these Duke partners for their efforts to make this event a success. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Dan Rabinowitz and Dr. Erica Weinthal, who will moderate questions later on in the program. Dan is a professor of sociology and anthropology at Tel Aviv University and a faculty fellow at the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. Over his distinguished career, he has contributed to numerous scientific articles in international journals and he's written several books on Israel and the Middle East. He is also the chairman of the Association for Environmental Justice in Israel. Dan, welcome to Duke. Erica is a professor of environmental policy and public policy at Duke University. She specializes in the global environmental politics and environmental security, with a particular emphasis on water and energy. She has authored and co-authored books on international politics and environmental cooperation. And she's a founding member and serves as a vice president of the Environmental Peace Building Association. Thanks, Erica, for making Dan's visit possible. And now, Dan, take it from here, please. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Really excited to be here with uh, all of you. Uh, let me just share the screen. So as I say, I'm happy to be here and to join all of you today. I'm grateful to Duke's and Nicholas Institute for Environment and then Environmental Seminar Seminar Series for for this, and I'm honored to be collaborating um, with uh, the Duke Energy Initiative, the Duke Center for International and Global Studies, and with Duke's Middle East Studies. Uh, I want to acknowledge in particular um, the role that Professor Erika Weintel has had in setting all of this up. Thanks, Erika. And thank you, uh, Brian, uh, Stacy, Jacob, and the others for um, making this happen. Um, I'll begin with a presentation of about uh, 20 minutes or so um, about the book and then uh, as Brian suggested, we can go on uh, with Erica's comments and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, so um, the book um, sets off by reviewing um, climate predictions for the Middle East. In a nutshell, the Middle East, which is already hotter and drier than most parts of the world, is going to heat up uh, generally faster and more than other parts, with um, many scaled down climate models suggesting 3.3 to sometimes four degrees uh, uh, centigrade hike by the end uh, of the century. Here is a sample. Um, some locations, uh, including the Gulf, will see summer temperature hike by up to six degrees by the end of the century. This uh, is the World Bank Climate Knowledge Portal's uh, past temperature record for Kuwait from 1901 to 2016. And you, note, you can note that these are 24 hour average temperatures by month. So daily highs, this is in the past. The past record are obviously significantly uh, higher than what you see here, regularly hitting the mid forties in the summer. So summer averages June, July, August in the high 30s, but daily highs going even higher. And this is what is in store for the future. Um, this, is a, of, this of course translates to a 24 hour average in summer of about 42 or 43 degrees because we saw the 36, 37 in the previous slide and then you add the six degrees for the summer months, July, August, and September. Uh, so you're looking at um, 24 hour average in summer of lower 40s, but daily highs regularly hitting 50 for three months a year. Throw in a high humidity factor for that particular region and you have many months uh, um, every year 
well above the threshold of 35 wet bulb temperature um, in centigrade, um, which is deemed as the upper limit for sustained um, inhab inhabitability. Um, a second theme in the book is climate inequalities in the region, both between states and within them. And I look at three types of climate inequality. Um, these are playing out in many regions of the world, but they are particularly harsh in the Middle East and in North Africa. And you can see them here as responsibility, I call them responsibility, vulnerability, and commitment. Uh, inequality in terms of responsibility for the climate crisis, of course, translates to diff different countries and communities emitting differentiated quantities of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So that's um, inequality in, in responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, second is disparities in exposure and vulnerability. Again, something that we witness all over the world, but is um, pretty radical, it can, could be pretty radical in, in, in the Middle East and North Africa. And of course it stems from differentiated capabilities on the part of countries and communities in the region to withstand what is in store uh, as the post-normal climate conditions set in. Um, and um, the third um, um, element of inequality, of climate inequality is disparities in the commitment on the part of various countries in the region to join the global struggle and to keep climate change uh, at bay, especially uh, those in the Middle East who are oil producers who uh, might be forced to leave some of their most important economic assets buried in the ground if an effective and workable global climate pact actually takes place. Um, this is the scoreboard of the fossil of the day um, tongue in cheek award um, during the Par Paris climate conference in, in 2015. It shows that the Saudi delegation an erst, erstwhile obstructionist of the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change process is leading the board with 12 dubious awards. And, uh, and it should be said that, that, that the Saudi stance on the UNFCCC is really representative of a number of uh, oil producing countries in, in the region. We will come back to them in, uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so, and third, the book examines the nexus between global warming, agriculture decline, forced migration, conflict, and climate refugees. Um, I examine Syria and Sudan uh, as sort of tragic early examples of extreme decline due to, partly due to uh, climate change, which could be the new normal uh, in the region. So to sum up so far, um, the, 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 the first three themes of the book are climate predictions for the Middle East, which are problematic, climate inequalities between and within countries in the Middle East, which are harsher than elsewhere, and uh, the nexus between global warming, food production, um, conflict, and, uh, and insecurity in the region. Um, and I'm happy to go back to uh, any of these three issues in, in Q&A. But for the rest of my short introduction, what I would like to do is focus on the fourth uh, area covered uh, in the book, uh, which actually makes its main argument and I find is, is also uh, sort of sounding most provocative to, mo to most. So in a nutshell, it goes as follows. The energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables has begun. This is, would not come as, as news to, to, to all of you, but it began too late and is um, progressing in, in a pace that might be too slow. Uh, and so, so we still are standing to lose the race against climate, climate chaos. And thanks to a particular uh, set of circumstances, uh, major oil producing countries in the Middle East may find themselves in a unique position to accelerate this transition and play a positive role in the struggle against climate change, not necessarily through a change of heart or an ideological or a greening um, process, 
but rather because circumstances and economic circumstances around them are changing um, rapidly and they, and they need to, uh, to, to adjust to this. So the energy transition has begun. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of running through these three phases very quickly. Um, we, when we look at the distribution of oil demand, uh, for example, in the OECD uh, in 2017 by sectors, we see that um, road still gulps up uh, about 50% of um, global oil supplies. Uh, and you can see the other uh, sectors there like uh, aviation and residential and a few others. And we know where oil, uh, where road transportation is going. It's going there with private cars. By 2025, all major car producers will have hybrid or fully electric models um, leading their brands. Uh, and by 2030, uh, in Europe at least, it'll be very difficult to buy a, a, an internal combustion car. Uh, road transport is going also there and there. Um, aviation is changing much in a slower pace. It represents about 8% of pre-COVID demand for global demand for oil. The process will take longer, but, um, uh, but coming decades would, will see demand of oil going down there. And even uh, with uh, heavy industry, uh, some solar and, and other renewable energy um, solutions could change even heavy industry um, and, and, and reduce uh, demand for oil there. Meanwhile, there is a, a revolution in power generation um, uh, all over the world. It's happening in different paces, but I think that the lockdown in mid-2020 um, demonstrated that it's not going anywhere and it, in a, if anything, it's going to deepen. Um, projections for the future even, and, and, and this, this even as, a, as a, the current situation in Europe uh, is that the, the, on average, most uh, countries in Europe are already past the 20% uh, renewable energy um, segment of their power uh, sectors and um, projections for the future. This one from uh, International Renewable, Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, looks at a scenario by which by 2050, um, up to 65% uh, of uh, global energy would come from renewables. I think these are um, th these are trends that are actually happening. And as I say, they are not happening due to an ideological shift, but mainly due to the economics of it. I'm sure all of you know this uh, particular uh, graph or maybe others similar to it, uh, showing that for most types of uh, fuels, the last decade has been more or less static, but um, solar and mainly PV uh, costs have plunged dramatically um, by more than 90 or 95%. Um, and this is a transition that is already happening. Um, uh, if we look at uh, the sources of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then uh, we can see that the electricity sector accounts for about 40, even more transportation, anything between 20 and 25. And if transportation is going electric, and electricity production is going renewable, then there is reason for optimism uh, in terms of a transition that uh, is destined to, to go in, in the right place. The question is, of course, is the energy transition happening fast enough? And I think that here, you will, um, most people agree that it isn't uh, in terms of the prognosis for uh, global warming. I like um, this metaphor. Um, of the transition to renewable um, as a train that has left the station, but partly because it has been running late for quite a while, now it finds itself um, winding up a forest um, a mountain side, which is steep uh, and chased by a forest fire. Um, and of course, um, uh, there is concern, uh, can it accelerate safely and quickly enough to get to the top and slide down the other side before the um, forest fire catches, catches it. Um, if we want to push this metaphor further, we can say that the gradient of the slope that the 
Ukraine is, is, is negotiating um, is, can be, is analogous to the level of robustness and the political resilience of the regime of subsidies for fossil fuels, which uh, keeps fossil fuels afloat and, and restrains this transition, even as the market is turning against them. And uh, I won't go into the, in detail here, but I, but I know that, uh, that, 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 that some of you are experts in this. This is where my focus on uh, the Middle East and mainly the six um, kingdoms by the Persian Arabian Gulf comes into play. Um, Saudi Arabia is obviously the most dominant, but Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Oman, together with uh, the Saudi Arabia, make the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council Six, a, new, a union that was established in the 1980s, mainly to better coordinate uh, the production and marketing of oil and gas, and which in many ways uh, makes the backbone of um, um, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting uh, Countries, even though um, Qatar has, has now left uh, for, um, for OPEC plus, but still this, co this cooperation is very important in the international um, uh, oil trade. Uh, the six countries together, you, you can see them on the right in the brown sector represent, account for 28% of um, global oil expo exports and for a similar um, proportion of um, global oil reserves. Now, this of course has enabled these countries as major oil producers, um, extraordinary um, prosperity over the last uh, five decades. Um, some of the figures are really astounding. Um, you can see that the average annual GDP growth amongst these six economies has been um, over seven or eight percent, sometimes hitting 10 percent over a period uh, sustained over a period of 25, 25 years. And uh, if you want some other figures, then look at Saudi, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. This is the, uh, this is the growth in GDP between 1973 and 2014. 50 times in the case of Saudi Arabia, 140 times in the case of the United Arab Emirates. For, for, for comparison, I've included Germany and the USA, which, which also grew in, in, in this time frame, but not as quickly. But the future uh, now looks um, much less bright for this part of the world. Um, one uh, element is, of course, the harsh climate prediction, which I mentioned before, and I bring this slide again as a, as, a, as, as a reminder. And the other one is the approaching uh, end of the, of the oil era. Um, this is a photo in a museum in Poland situated uh, in a 19th century salt mine that is uh, now of course defunct. The, uh, the analogy between the decline of oil uh, and what happened to 19th century salt barons in Europe is I think suggestive. Um, salt was an important commodity in pre-modernity, the, the only way to preserve uh, meat and other food, foodstuffs. Um, and those controlling it, both in Europe, but also in India and even in North America, uh, wielded economic and political power. Uh, when uh, then electric, uh, electric, electric refrigeration um, replace salt, first um, commercial industrial uh, production of ice, and then actual ref refrigeration replaced salt in the late 19th century, um, in uh, both in storehouses and in eventually in, in restaurants and in homes, um, demand for salt was decimated and became redundant economically. Um, and I think that uh, this, uh, this dual um, problem of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, post oil and post uh, normal climate condition is something that is, um, there are signs that this double trouble is um, creating a sense of urgency about the future in, uh, amongst the oil producers in, in the Middle East. 
uh, and could perhaps drive them to seek change from unexpected uh, quarters, which brings me to another natural resource that the kingdoms by the Gulf are blessed with, uh, and that is uh, sunshine. Um, uh, with more than double the global average solar energy per meter square, uh, with a, an abundance of unproductive land because of the lack of water that can be and is already being used for solar panels, um, with lots of available capital and with an impressive record of incorporating innovation into civil infrastructure, um, these um, countries by the Gulf are already turning towards um, uh, alternative energy and, and, and solar energy, not as quickly as, 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 as some, are say, uh, some are hoping, but it's definitely happening or beginning to happen. Um, and even for them, give, even with uh, very cheap uh, energy and uh, oil and gas, the figures are finally aligning favorably for solar. These are some uh, recent tenders in the United Arab uh, Emirates and other uh, uh, countries in the region. And many of them are closing um, at uh, $20 per megawatt or near there. Um, this is on a par or even cheaper than some power generated from gas um, in that area. Um, so, um, so, in, so, so how might major oil producers respond to the, uh, to, to the, to the looming uh, problematic future they have in terms of climate and in terms of the uh, end of oil? How might they be enticed to take more advantage of these, um, of, the, of solar energy? which so far uh, only the United Arab Emirates has taken up in a serious, in a serious manner and, and now produces about 3.5 of its electricity from um, solar sources. It's not a bad figure, but, but certainly not um, outstanding. Um, so uh, so here's a, here are my thoughts, uh, which as I say, come in the, in the final part of the book about, about this potential. Um, one thing that uh, the six countries of the GCC6 have uh, been pledging to do for a while now, and as I just showed, they're beginning to do, is to accelerate their own transition to renewables. This is something that is within their reach and it already makes sense um, uh, economically. Of course, uh, it has implications for uh, their um, ability and, and, and will to go on selling uh, oil. Um, but um, the second thing, thing that they could do is that they could invest in renewable capacity and technology abroad. Uh, and here again, I think that uh, necessity would, 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 uh, would play a, a bigger part than any kind of ideological trend. If we are, if we are looking uh, 10 or 15 years from now and thinking about uh, the, the, the analogy to the salt barons, then um, sitting and waiting for the oil era to end on them would probably be the worst choice. So they could invest in renewable capacity and technology abroad. And then finally, uh, when uh, the right moment has come in five or 10 or 15 years from now, when the global share of um, the global renewable market is, is big enough, maybe even as big as uh, their share of in, in oil market today, today, they could choose the right moment for them and use their market power in the, in the global energy and make the break from um, oil and gas to uh, renewable on their own terms. Use the spike that might come in 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 the price of uh, of, uh, of oil and and and, and gas as a, as a as a result, and enjoy um, renewables in which they by then will have a big stake, becoming um, sort of finally clinching uh, the, the 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 top spot in in, in the world energy, and then, and they could this way sort of make good on their investment. I leave you with uh, um, the story of William Durant. Some of you may know about it. William Durant was the leading carriage maker in the United States in the late 19th century. He was a millionaire by the time he was 30. Um, and uh, 
he was very much against the motor car when the when motor cars were first sold in the, in America in the 19, in 1890s. He thought they were noisy and dangerous and need to be strictly regulated and taken off the roads. But in 1903, he realized uh, that uh, they're not going anywhere. So he changed direction and um, bought a fledgling uh, company uh, in Flint, Michigan called Buick, then joined forces with Henry Chevrolet. They created, GM and um, the rest is history. So, um, so this ability to uh, realize that he was not so much in the carriage business as he was in the transportation business and take the assets and the market power that he had in the carriage business uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the knowledge uh, of various parts of the industry into the next stage is something that I think uh, could, um, could be very uh, interesting in the case of the uh, GCC6. Uh, it obviously raises uh, this idea or this notion, counterintuitive counter as it is, obviously raises lots of um, issues. Um, but I, and one of them is, you know, what is the chosen path for, um, sustainability and for uh, fighting climate change. Um, I leave you with the, this image and um, give it back to you. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you, Don. Um, that was a great survey of the book. Um, and I have to say, reading the book, it is incredibly beautifully written the way you are able to weave together so many of these stories um, that take us through the Middle East, but also tie you know, back to the history of salt, to um, the history of the automobile industry, but also capture how climate change has um, exacerbated problems of inequality, injustice, and led to migration and displacement in many of the countries in the Middle East. And in, and so when I read the book, I actually am seeing five different books that you have actually written into one very short, succinct book. Um, it is also, you know, the way you conclude with focusing on the Gulf, it is extremely um, thought provoking. It's controversial. It is a provocative prop proposition, what you're putting out there. Um, it's, I'm sure you've received, you know, substantive, you know, significant, um, comments, critiques of this focus on the Gulf as the potential um, leaders in thinking about a, what you call a post-normal climate, you know, post-normal climate or climate transition. Um, and so I'm gonna use, you know, my role as the moderator to ask, you know, to start with a few questions and then I'm gonna turn it over um, to those who are listening and I see questions are beginning to come in through the Q&A. So I um, encourage you to continue to send questions through the Q&A. Um, and I'm gonna start with, the first question I wanna start with is gonna be focused on sort of these inequalities in the Middle East. And then I'm gonna turn to a question that's very specific to the Gulf states, but I'll start with the first one. Um, when we talk about, you know, these questions of inequalities, um, in the Middle East, North Africa, I mean, these are really stark inequalities that you sh um, have shown in the book. Um, you also lay out, you know, just the disparities um, when it comes to water access, um, the situation in Gaza, the situation in Yemen. Um, Sana is, you know, one of the cities that everybody says is running out of water, but then you have ski slopes in Dubai. Um, and so, you know, the Middle East is huge and these disparities are huge. Um, as you note in the book, it, it's one of the most unequal regions in the world. And often when we talk about the Middle East, North Africa, we increasingly talk about adaptation, that this is a region that's going to have to adapt to these climate impacts. Um, and so I want to start with some of that because one of your conclusions is actually we should, you know, it's almost focused on mitigation or pay or even it's between mitigation and adaption but paying the gulf countries not to produce which has been tried in places like ecuador and unsuccessful 
unsuccessfully. But what about those that are resource poor? Those where we see the greatest inequalities and have seen the greatest burden and are most vulnerable to these climate change impacts. And when we talk about adaptation, we're often, often talking about water and less about energy. Energy has often been the, you know, tied to more to mitigation. And so, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, in, in some ways, you know, this notion that we can use, like we should be paying those that have caused the damage to not produce, but then who should be paying to help those that need to adapt? Shouldn't it be the, you know, conversely that the Gulf states should also be contributing to adaptation? Um, and tied to that, you know, what is the rest of the world's um, obligation to those that are most vulnerable? So that was a long lead into hopefully a short question. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Erica. Um, I think that in a, in a way the sort of provocative ending of the book um, um, doesn't do justice for the rest to the rest of it because because it does uh, uh, sometimes create the notion that you know between adaptation and uh, mitigation I think that. Um, our focus of attention should be um, mitigation. I, 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 I don't. And, uh, and I think that the, the, the chapter on inequality, you know, exposes this quite, quite starkly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the global um, impact of the Middle East might, might come if my um, ideas about what the Gulf states might decide to do in order to survive in the post oil era uh, might come from mitigation. But I think that uh, there's no question that the most burning question uh, in uh, issue in, in the Middle East, and I'm using burning you know, uh, in, uh, purposefully, is, is how will some of the poorer countries in the Middle East survive the next 40 or 50 years? Um, whether we're looking at Sudan or at Yemen uh, or Syria, but even um, uh, places like, like Jordan, um, um, the, the, the burden is going to be uh, overwhelming and the, and the opening uh, conditions in terms of uh, economic, um, technology, governance, uh, resilience um, are abysmal. So yes, this is, this is if, if, if you like, looking internally into the Middle East, I think that adaptation is, is probably more important than mitigation. It's my, um, uh, my, my attempt to uh, also look at the role that the Middle East could play globally that pushed me in the mitigation uh, uh, direction. And, 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 and sort of encouraged me um, identifying the, 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 the particular circumstances, some of them ironic of, 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 of the Gulf states as an opportunity. It's ironic because um, it, it's philosophically, if you look at it, you, you think the area that by sort of some geological fluke became the most important source of fossil fuels in the world and, and as such has contributed indirectly to probably 40 or 45 degree um, cent, uh, percent of all fossil fuels ever burnt and, and emitted to the, to, to the atmosphere coming from uh, Middle Eastern fossil fuels um, is now the area where the impact of climate change is going to be most dramatic. And on top of everything else, because of even, you know, vast tracts of, 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 of empty land and, and, and abundance of, of solar uh, uh, radiation and, 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 and lots of money to invest could also become part of the solution. So this, is, this, this really sort of uh, is mind boggling in, 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 in a sort of historical philosophical way. And, um, but, but, I, but I do go along with your uh, point, Erica, that knowing the Middle East and knowing the disparities within it, uh, there's no question that, uh, that the adaptation is, is, the most, is the most worrying and most um, uh, urgent. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, but I'm also going to tie it to a question that has come through um, in the Q&A, just because they seem to feed off of each other. Um, you know, I'm a political scientist, so I have spent a lot of time thinking about the resource curse um, when it comes to the Gulf. And that is something that is, you know, absent from the book is a discussion of the resource curse and all the perverse incentives that are often, you know, the political and economic centers that are associated with being a oil rich country, which, you know, have been linked to, um, you know, poor economic outcomes, um, you know, this lack of democracy, civil war, um, low investments in social, you know, um, in human development indicators. But, you know, the Gulf in some ways is a mix because they've done well economically and they have maintained political stability um, because of access to all these oil rents that have been used in many ways to um, support a very um, broad, you know, um, form of social spending, you know, subsidies um, with fuel, um, food, um, but also jobs, employment in um, government um, positions. And so, you know, what the resource curse in many ways would lead us to suggest is that there, you know, it's very unlikely that we're going to see diversification of the economy, which you do talk about this need for diversification, um, because of these, you know, the incentives are so short term. This concern with, um, you know, capturing rents to basically ensure political acquiescence, and oil rents can be used for repressive means, which we have seen in the Gulf, especially um, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, how one would think about, you know, this shift to renewables and, you know, diversifying away from um, the oil and gas sector when the incentives may not be there. These countries have natural resource funds, a few of them, but they're not very transparent. We don't know what's happening with the oil and, you know, gas rents, unlike, you know, Norway, which has a much more transparent natural resource fund. Um, and one of the questions that came in too was, you know, does the promise of a post oil future, in fact, incentivize oil rich countries to sell as much oil as possible in the short term? So might we see a perverse incentive where they may say, okay, we need to sell off everything. So we have the rents that we can then use for the rainy day. And how would you prevent that? These are excellent points. I think that um, uh, the, 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 the oil rich countries of the Gulf are probably the, 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 the best or worst examples of a resource, resource curse. Uh, you know, in, in all walks of life, you know, the, the, in terms of, the, of inequality, in terms of repression, in terms of uh, alliances with international corporations that are you know, there for the, for, for the oil rent, um, corruption, all the rest of it. Uh, and I think that um, in, in a way, I, uh, I, what I'm trying to do in the book is really a geo-jitsu kind of maneuver. And that is that I'm not, I'm not really thinking of, about this, um, uh, these, these countries joining the energy transition because of any um, ideological or change of heart. I'm actually saying, Let's look at the same uh, things that are driving them now and see how they respond to a world that is really turning around them. Um, because if, if we were looking at the next 50 years and say circumstances in terms of both oil, uh, demand for oil, and in terms of, uh, of, uh, of climate are going to be the same as, the, as they were, then there's no, uh, there's no room, there's no political space uh, for any change. But there is an acute awareness. I don't think anybody in the Gulf needed my book to, uh, to, to realize that the, that the, that the future is, is, is really turning and that then their, their, their options are narrowing very quickly and very dramatically. And then the question um, is raised, and, and I think it's a fascinating question in terms of political science, is you know, how do, how do countries like these, regimes like this, dynasties like these, how do they respond 
to um, a world that might look completely different for them and, and not in a good way within 10, 15, 20 years, maybe shorter. Uh, what is the short term and middle term and long term for them and how do they respond? Yes, I think that the question about um, hurrying to sell as much oil as, as possible is absolutely on the spot. This is what I expect them to do as much as they can in the immediate future. But at the same time, the questions that are being asked there now about the middle and long range, this is where the, um, uh, the this, um, using the same impulses and the same uh, drives, including greed and greed for power and, and, and all the rest of it, this is where it could counterintuitively work in a good direction for the um, and for, for the for sustainability and for for the energy transition which we are all hoping will be accelerated great thank you um so we have some questions that are a little bit more focused on the technical side focused on dust which i know you talk about in the book but which did not come up as much mm -hmm. um in the presentation and you know this pertains to some of the challenges that um, the Gulf countries might face in installing um, these large amounts of solar infrastructure and then exporting energy um, from them. Um, you know, one, it will be expensive and difficult to transport the water to clean the dust off all the solar panels. And I know you talk about the differences in the types of solar technologies. Um, so I think it, um, if you could maybe elaborate on that, how the region could overcome this challenge of you know these dust storms, which are also a function you know of the changing climate that are intensifying. Excellent point. Um, well, renewable energy is going to grow um, significantly everywhere, but solar is the one with the highest potential. Um, it hasn't been the case in the last decade or two. So solar hasn't been growing as as quickly. But uh, the forecasts anywhere, not only in the, in the region, are that um, this, the solar is the, really, is the growth area within renewables. Now, for the Middle East, um, uh, photovoltaic is, is much um, more of a proposition than uh, concentrated uh, solar power, CSP. Uh, PV is um, less susceptible to uh, dust particles in the air because um, it uses uh, solar energy and direct solar energy in, 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 in a way that is less sensitive for turbulence and, and dust particles. Uh, concentrated solar power is, is, is more, um, is more um, susceptible. And this is why I think that PV is, and, 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 the, and the plans on the ground all seem to, to point in the direction that, 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 that in the Middle East, uh, where the Arabian Peninsula and then the Sahara Desert next door are amongst the biggest uh, suppliers of, of dust particles in the world, uh, it's, it's a natural choice to go for PV and, 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 and absorb the, 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 the dust particles, but knowing, knowing that they, are, they cannot really uh, make too much of a difference for efficiency. Um, nevertheless, I think that the, the problem that, that has just been mentioned is, is one of a number of drawbacks that will, will exist. And the more uh, climate change uh, and global warming um, uh, reduces vegetation, both um, wild vegetation and, and agriculture, the more um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the Sahara will, will keep um, uh, producing dust that would make uh, maintenance, maintenance and, 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 and efficient running of um, uh, photovoltaic um, panels uh, a challenge. But I think that this is a, a challenge that is workable. I think that it's not a, uh, it's not a, a deal breaker in, term, in terms of, uh, of PV. And, and I know from the experience both in Israel, but also already in the Gulf, that there are some very efficient and, and, and very well run uh, large photovoltaic uh, fields, both in, um, in the Gulf and in North, in, in North Africa. Morocco is doing extremely well with that, and so is Egypt. So I think that, yes, the, the challenge is there. Climate change, uh, the loop of climate change and, and more dust 
will, uh, will, will continue to be there, but I think that solutions can be found. So we have some other questions that are just asking more about um, the broader um, energy transitions or what could be done to reduce emissions. Um, you know, there's a question about, um, you know, could you, I mean, these are, I mean, in the book in so many ways is about um, envisioning an alternative future for the Middle East, um, a very hopeful one and asking about whether you could see the possibility of, you know, um, sort of bullet trains or trains, you know, um, energy efficient trains rather than this reliance on automobiles in the Middle East. Like, are there any other efforts to, I guess, thinking about it more broadly, what other efforts are happening um, in the Middle East that are um, investments in renewable energy, um, or technologies broadly. Okay. I'm not sure that there is a sort of a real um, sort of excellent news about, about train travel in the Middle East. But I, I think that some of the, of the Gulf countries are investing more than they did in public transport. Um, metro in Dubai, um, buses in Abu Dhabi, and a few others. Um, I think that one area where a, a real vision exists is a, a regional power distribution network. Uh, right now, these countries are not interconnected in one grid, uh, but there are thoughts that I think are very interesting, interesting in, in, in pooling together uh, their power generation capacity, incorporating much more solar, and then um, having a, a, a super grid that would also extend to their neighbors, including Iraq in the north, and maybe even north of Iraq, and then uh, Yemen and across uh, and across uh, the, the sea to, to to East Africa. I think this is this is an interesting um, proposition. Um, uh, you know, we, we are thinking about visions and I wrote the book because I thought, you know, I, I'm interested in, 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 in exploring visions, but, but there are also um, sort of counter, counter forces working um, in, in the region. And, and I think that uh, if, if, we, if we want to be realistic, we need to take into account that there are, there are many f vectors that, that are, are working and will continue working to resist and to sort of to extend the, the golden age of oil as, as much as possible. I'll give you one recent example, the new relationship between the United Arab Emirates and Israel um, that was signed only a few months ago. Uh, in terms of energy, many of us were hopeful that uh, there will be a collaboration both on technology and also on implementation of more solar energy, both in the region and, and globally. And there are one or two initiatives in that direction. But the, uh, but the first thing the two, the two governments did uh, in, in, in relation to, en to energy is to um, play with the idea of running United Arab Emirates and Gulf oil generally again through a lot and the uh, terrestrial pipeline that uh, connects the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, which uh, was built in the 1970s to, uh, to, uh, to transport Iranian oil, has been more or less redundant for the last 10 years. And now we'll, we're, the, 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 the news that was just released is that Israel and the United Arab Emirates will reuse uh, this route with big tankers coming from the Gulf to a lot and then running through the pipeline to uh, the port of Ashdod and from there to, uh, to, 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 to Europe. This is like nurturing dinosaurs for me. Um, and, and, and I was dismayed to, to see that this is, you know, it's, it's like the, the tail end of, of a dying industry, but is heralded as, you know, the, the, the future. Uh, so, that, so there's a lot of work to be done in, in the region as, in, as, as elsewhere between these competing, competing visions. 
Thanks. Um, so we have a question too about going back, you know, to the, prem the beginning premise of the book that discusses many of these inequities in the region, asking about how do we ensure that the transition to renewable energy is a just one, um, that it addresses these um, extreme inequities, um, what incentives need to be put in place in the Gulf, but also in other parts of the Middle East to address, you know, everything from social inequities, human rights issues, um, you know, wealth disparities. This is an excellent question. I think what we have learned from history is that uh, energy transitions are always tied up to um, social, economic, um, and political uh, realities. Um, this is, you know, Tim Mitchell's work on the transition from oil to from 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 coal to oil uh, was really a, a, a study in in, in labor and in, in, in the political role of, of unions uh, that change completely uh, between coal and, and, and oil. And I think many people are asking themselves this question. Um, and I, uh, I'm not sure I have, I have the answer. I think it's, uh, it's, it's important not only in the case of the, of, the, of the Middle East, it's important elsewhere. Of course, there is the, on the one hand, there is the, the, the promise of decentralization. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, solar energy can be produced and, and power from solar, solar energy can be produced by local producers that are, um, that, that in some circumstances can produce and, can, and become uh, prosumers, producers and consumers. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I think that I join the question rather than answering it because I think this is one of the challenges uh, of, 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 of our future. Uh, making the transition necessarily work for uh, uh, reducing inequality is, uh, is 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 really a, a great a great challenge. I'm not sure that we have the the, 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 the answers. And in a way, the fact that uh, the transition is still dependent very much on capital is an impediment because as long as we are depending on on major capital then the transition of capital accumulated in fossil fuels into capital um, invested in renewables for the future, which is uh, the backbone of what I am uh, suggesting in a, in a very, in a, in a very in, in broad strokes, uh, could well end, us, uh, end, end up in the same amount, in, in the same kind of inequality and, and the concentration of power amongst those who are transferring their um, market share from fossil fuels to renewables. Um, so this remains an open question and an, and an excellent one. Great. Um, so one of the other, um, you know, things that comes across in the, in the book, um, again, which I don't, um, is this connection between, you know, water energy and food or agriculture, like you really do capture the intersection um, between these three sectors and how um, the nexus. And there is a question that's asking about, you know, um, again, how the oil companies will respond um, to shifting away from fossil fuels to renewables, but also thinking about you know, what are the potential markets for renewables versus um, fossil fuels? And part of this, when I think about it, there's, it also has to take into account sort of the, the intersection of these, mark, of these, these, the nexus between energy, water, and food, because as you talk about in the book too, the Gulf imports so much water through virtual water for its food sector. And so, you know, how does one then think about, you know, what are, what are future markets going to look like and how will the oil companies in and of themselves adapt, especially since the infrastructure had such significant sunk costs and can this infrastructure be repurposed? Great questions. Um, I, I think that um, there is a difference between a country trying to respond to these new circumstances and an oil company. 
Now, the, 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 the GCC6 are in a, in a way a bit of both. They are not uh, completely on their own because they're all tied up to large corporations. So they are not, um, it's not an entirely sovereign decision on their part. And, 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 I, and I think that the question of how oil companies will respond is an excellent one. Um, in, in some ways, uh, oil companies have more leeway and more, and, and more flexibility than, than a country whose only resource is, uh, is fossil fuels. So I think we need to, uh, to, to wait and see about that. Um, about the nexus to, uh, to, to water, um, it's, 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 it's something that if you look at the recent history of the, of the, of the Middle East, you cannot really avoid. Um, this, the, 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 the tragic, tragic crisis in Syria began with five years of uh, consecutive bitter drought, which threw the um, agricultural hinterland of, of Syria into complete chaos and then snowballed into people unable to, main, to, to, to maintain their own domestic economy and household economy because food was not produced as much as before and people and peasants couldn't, couldn't make ends meet and then then they are forced to leave. Um, the agricultural hinterland becomes forsaken. Uh, the, the cities uh, within Syria, but also across the borders are not really geared to absorb them. And you really get this snowball, which has many other moving parts, except for climate change, but is driven by, by climate change uh, in ways that, uh, that, are, that, that are very worrying because they could become the, the new normal. Uh, so I think this, this nexus in this, in this respect, I think the Middle East uh, is, is, an, is an excellent laboratory, but uh, with, with these two tragic cases of Sudan on the one end and, and Syria on the other, um, giving us a very vivid uh, example of what might happen uh, elsewhere as well, because these um, uh, connections uh, from drought to water shortage to agricultural collapse to forced migration to um, destabilize the major cities to civil conflict, major climate uh, refugee uh, uh, syndromes. And I think nowhere uh, is, is immune from, from, uh, from, from this syndrome. And I think this is why the case of the Middle East uh, should really be something that many people in other parts, especially in vulnerable parts of the world, uh, look at very closely. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're at one o'clock and I know this conversation <laughs> could go on. And part of this is, is that this book is so rich. I mean, you tap into so many of these you know, of issues not just related to, um, you know, a um, a post fossil fuel, you know, world, um, climate change, inequities, um, but you even conclude by some thoughts on what the pandemic means. And so, I really want to encourage everyone to read this book um, because it is so far reaching but provocative, um, and which. Um, and captivating and a really easy, wonderful read. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you um, for this very thought-provoking presentation opportunity to chat with you and have you join um, the Duke community today. And to all of our guests, including Duke students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, thank you too for joining us.